Aaron Bach with SK, uh, project manager in the Greensboro office, and Tim and I are going to be working together. You guys may know Tim as well. He works here out of the, the Charlotte office, and we're going to talk about special inspections, some of the requirements, try and get a better understanding of exactly what Chapter 17 of the building code is. This is an approved uh, course. We have the number up here. You guys sign in, give license number, AIA number, definitely can make sure that you get credit for it. We have applied for the HSW credit if you are an AIA. Uh, we're still waiting to hear from that, and so we'll keep you posted on that, but make sure you get signed in and we'll make sure that you get your credit. So special inspections. This, this course is designed to give a better understanding of what special inspections is how we get there, why it started, um, and to do that, we'll answer a couple of different questions. So what, what are special inspections? Why do we need them? When are they required? And that's kind of the nuts and bolts of the presentation. How do you actually get to all of the different components of special inspections plan? How are they implemented? And then who actually does the, the special inspections review? So, special inspections defined by the code is review of materials, installation, the process for construction. And there's a lot of different components of it, but in general, it is a review of all the construction by an expert, someone that is trained, educated in the actual process. There's a couple of different types of inspection, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, continuous, and obviously it's pretty much what it says. It's being in the, the presence of the work that's going on, specifically watching the actual construction, reviewing of the materials, everything associated with the actual work being taken place on a continuous basis. Periodic special inspections is that random check. Sometimes the, the periodic is time frame. Sometimes it's periodic and you're only selecting a certain quantity, not a 100% review of the different components. It's just a random selection of the actual materials, uh, the actual construction areas. Now, to be clear, in the, the code, as well as guidelines that are set forth by the State Construction Office, they it's, it's different than the actual designer review. <coughs> Structural observation is a review of the actual construction that is done by the designer of record. Special inspection does not offset the, the requirement for the inspectors, the designers of record, to come in and do the work, the actual review. It is, in addition to, it's another check, another level of documentation, trying to enhance and ensure that the construction is done per the plans and specifications. So, talk about history of it. How did we actually get here? Why did special inspections happen? So, you may know a couple of these projects coming up. Hyatt Regency, Kansas City, Missouri, 1981. Okay. Very famous structural failure, unfortunately infamous, I guess you'd say. A couple of elevated walkways that were suspended, the fourth floor and second floor walkways, and then there was a third floor that was offset on the other side, but they overlooked the, the lobby that you can see. About a year after the construction completed, there was a tea dance going on in the lobby of the, of the hotel. Hundreds, thousands of people that were down on that lobby floor, and as people were trying to get a better view, they came up onto these elevated walkways. This is the fourth floor that's up there, the second floor down. During the construction process, there was a change in the actual connection details, the hanger rods. And again, probably have heard a lot of this before. I was watching the AISC steel conference just earlier this week, and they were talking about it. The initial design had the rods all in a line, except running up and down. And so they literally suspended right one from another. The contractor during the process changed the connection a little bit. He offset the rod for the lower walkway onto these double channels that were welded together to try and ease construction for him. He could get the initial walkway <coughs> set and then 
bring the rods down to set the, the second floor. That change ultimately reduced the capacity, again, in these the, the tubes that were there. They were welded up, but they were not properly welded. They were not properly stiffened. And it changed the load that on the nut that was um, securing the two the, the beams for the, the walkway slabs to the actual hanger rods. Going back afterward, looking at the actual calculations, running numbers to check, the capacity of the system was just good for the, the self-weight, just the load of the actual walkway system itself. As the people started to congregate and watch the tea party, fortunately that second floor slab came down and landed on top of a bunch of the crowd that was watching the tea dance down in the lobby. 114 people killed, 216 additional people injured. At that point in time, it was the worst, worst collapse in the history of the United States. <clears throat> Hartford, Connecticut, the uh, uh, Civic Center up there, entire roof came down during the snowstorm. No fatalities in this collapse, which is obviously a miracle. It's great. Um, about three, four hours before that, there was a hockey game going on in this arena during the snowstorm. People had cleared out, they had cleaned it, everyone got out. But had this happened a few hours earlier, obviously major, major loss of life. Again, it was some connection issues. It's a little bit small here. They changed connections during the actual um, submittal process and didn't resolve their the, the load path properly. Some of the members, the primary connections were 800% overstressed. Not a little bit, a lot. And it was literally just moving dimensions on the, the shop drawing process. Um, didn't get properly reviewed by the inspectors, didn't get properly reviewed uh, by the structural engineer of record. Again, it was in both of these cases, the, the SER wasn't properly retained through the CA process, not afforded the ability to really look through and make sure that their design was being carried out into the field. Uh, there was some, during the process, during the actual construction, there was very, very large deformations in the roof. 12, 14, 18 inches of, of sag in that those roof members as they went up and Again, without the proper review of this process, the contractor moved, kept moving through, built it, and fortunately, it came down. Luckily, again, like I said, not a major loss of life. Leambiance Plaza, also in Connecticut. This was an interesting project. It was a residential tower, 16 stories. It was using uh, lift slab. Uh, it was a, a contractor-driven delivery method where the slabs are actually constructed one on top of each other on the ground and then jacked into place. So you build your walls, you build your columns up, and then you cast all of your slabs down low, 6 inches, 12 inches, whatever it might be. This one, I believe, was in the, the 8 to 10 inch range, depending on the slabs. It reduces formwork, it reduces a lot of stuff, and then you, using hydraulics, you jack them up into place. Again, because the contractor-driven method, the, the structural engineer and the architectural uh, designer of record on this project did not get proper review time. They didn't get to see the actual, all the specifics that went into this project. They started the construction. As they worked through it, the, uh, they got, they were about a quarter of the way done and the entire thing came back. All 16 stories worth of walls, columns. I mean, you see there's a little bit remaining, but it's a massive, massive uh, failure at this point in time. There was a few things that ultimately the review of the, the uh, collapse showed. Improper drape in the PT tendons, overstressed concrete in particular around some of the, the shear walls that were in there, the lateral resistant walls. The, angles that they used during the lift process that they actually jacked against to get the slab up into place were undersized. Again, large deformations, uh, overstressed, and then some of the actual temporary connections. They get them up into place, they come in and they weld in some temporary connections to the steel columns that were there. Not properly designed, large deformations, all of it came down. All of those elements, construction related issues that could have, should have been caught. And 28 people died, workers, 22 workers injured. Um, it's interesting, after that 
and they put a ban, Connecticut put a ban on lift slab construction and while well, they investigated it. And following the, their investigation, they actually now, it's now allowed again, but it is required that you have third party structural engineers and architects review all of the specifics of the process of the plan and then both all the contractor, the designers of record, and this third party review have to sign off on the plan together saying that it's been checked and is suitable for construction. So, some major failures. Those are a few of, um, a bunch of them, unfortunately. The U.S. government, in particular the House of Representatives, decided that they were going to take a look at you know, what was going on, see if they could figure out what were some common core problems that, if they got rid of, reduced the chance of structural failures. Um, and they put together a subcommittee to study that. The subcommittee, which was headed by, at that point in time, Representative Al Gore, came up with 22 factors that they, of varying degrees, that they say contribute to success or failure of construction projects. Six of those factors they identified as critical. And you can see the factors listed up here. Communication and organization. Obviously, we talk about it all the time in whichever, you know, whatever role you are in the construction process, communication is absolutely critical. Inspection of construction by the structural engineer. They specifically noted in there that these structural failures, you have to have that inspection by the structural engineer. It's paramount, making sure that those designers are on site. And we talked about some of those collapses. This, the SER wasn't retained for CA, and it was a huge impact and a, a major contributing factor to why those, those failures occurred. General quality of design, and that kind of goes down here with the selection of architects. Obviously, picking good quality firms, designers that have a history of success, going to help that process without a doubt. And then the shop drawing. Again, some of those major, major failures were a result of poor connections and or poor interpretation of what the connections actually were. So placing a lot of emphasis on the review and detailing, both in the actual production, but in then in the, the review of it as well, making sure that uh, actual connections are properly done in the way that the design is. And then timely dissemination of the data, then it kind of comes back to communication. It's, it's critical. Then from that, there's a peer review process, ultimately that got established. And this is kind of the birth of special inspections. We want to make sure that the projects have quality control, quality assurance by professionals who have expertise in the different realms that you're looking at. So special inspections, how does that come into the code? First, implementation, 1988 BOCA. 2000 in the IBC. Here in North Carolina, we got into special inspections first in 2002. Um, at that point in time, it was not mandatory. It was at the discretion of the local or state building officials. And the state construction office started uh, requiring special inspections in 2003 on some of their projects. 2007, they um, made an amendment to the, uh, to the code to the 2006 code that ultimately made it mandatory. And then they set guidelines. There's the actual formula that you have to go through depending on your building type, construction materials, and we'll get into those specifics in a little bit. But if your building falls in under one of those categories and requires special inspections, as of 2007, it's now a requirement. Again, designer inspections still very important. All the different designers still have to come out. It's a supplement to the construction review process does not take the place of the designer of record coming out to do their review. <clears throat> Why do we need special inspections? Not just because the code says we do. There's a lot of advantages to why we need special inspections. Um, they're mandatory, obviously, but they do offer the designers, the contractors, and the owners and general public some advantages. Um, greater review to that, that process. I mean, obviously, having special inspectors, having those designers out there, your project is under scrutiny a lot much, a lot more than what it was previously. Um, 
that's a good thing. You know, it, they're, they're out there to make sure the construction is going in per plan. They're out there, and it's a much more timely uh, response to any discrepancies that might come up. There are some advantages to actually uh, to having the special inspector just besides they have to be out there. So this is um, a video from one of the projects that I worked on that we were special inspection on. Okay. This is a slab placement, concrete slab placement for a composite slab. We had gone out, we had done our pre, we had done our review the uh, day before. This was Saturday morning, 7 a.m. We had done our review of the day, checked the reinforcing steel, checked the deck, everything was in place. Most of you guys, you know, you know, water to slab is to concrete, not necessarily the, just the F11. Not really the, the best situation. Based on the amount of rain that the, the weather that NOAA showed for this time period, they added about 1,100 gallons of water to this 3,500 square foot concrete slab. Not the best situation. So. You calculate the water cement ratio? <laughs> we did. <laughs> so, obviously, that, that's not a good situation. Uh, we got it on video. We talked. Uh, the unfortunate part is we had actually run into the situation a week before with the slab on grade. Had gone through the entire process, talked to them, and still happened with this elevated slab. Being that it was a composite slab, a little more critical, we took some core samples. And it's hard to see in this, but you can right here is the depth of the water infiltration into this particular uh, core here, here. We actually had water that was in this five and a half inch thick, total thickness slab included the deck. We had water as deep as four inches in some of the areas, so it was down into the flutes. Clearly detrimental to that concrete slab. Was it going to fall down, be a catastrophe, people, you know, potential injury or fatality? Doubtful, however, Serious durability issues, not compliant, would have been a problem for the owner in the long run. So we got we got that taken care of, came in, we dealt with the problem. Yeah. How'd you deal with it? We had them take out a portion of the, the slab, get rid of it, that was the worst case, and we came back in, put new concrete in some of the other areas where, like this one for instance, it was a much more surface. They had placed it before it started raining, so it was a surface durability issue came in and added hardeners to it, but just because because we weren't so sure about how the long-term effects, we had them add some uh, tees to the underside of the steel beams that were down there because the steel beams were relying on the concrete slab for compression, we had them add in tees to strengthen the steel that was down there too. They had the option of tearing it all out and redoing it, but because they had already gotten to the point where the walls were up above it and they wanted to get the roof in place, they were likely to do the repairs versus tear out and rework that situation. Large so con it was sorry. sorry, this slab is one of the modern intermediate floors. It is, yeah. Okay. It was an elevated slab at the in a residence hall. Large contractor, a joint venture, large subcontractor, quality assurance programs, just happened. They just got caught, unfortunately. So this is another project worked on. This is just before special inspections was mandatory. And it's a middle school, Davie County. We we're the structural engineer of record on. We so we were going out, we were doing our site visits, weekly site visits. We probably made 50 to 60 site visits during the course of this project. So we were there a bunch. All right. The interesting part about this project is the steel erector who is a father and son uh, firm, the grandson of the, of the father started it and the son, of, the son of the son would be going to this school once it opened. So they were on site and they were paying a little more attention than what they probably normally would. The mason on the project got behind a little bit, started cutting corners. And every so often I would get these envelopes that got sent to me in the mail the steel corrector was being the special inspector. He was up on, as he was rigging steel, and he was seeing the mason do things that they weren't necessarily should be doing, covering up, not grouting, not providing reinforcing in the vertical. They actually would have the dowels coming out of the footing. 
They would build the wall after we come, we would come on a Tuesday, for instance. They would build vertically a section of wall, and then they would put the dowels coming out at the top and not reinforce the middle of the, the wall. But we had the special inspector, steel erector, taking pictures. <laughs> and he would send those pictures to me, and I'd get them in the mail. And they would tell me exactly where it was. So I'm like, let's go check. Having the picture in my hand, we walk out. Sure enough, we find places where there was no reinforcing steel, no grout. You can see here, ultimately we got to the point where we did some thermal scans to try and identify areas where there was missing grout, missing steel. Lentils, you know, no grout in the lentil here, no grout in the lentil here, no grout. These lentils, vertical cells missing. We ended up coming back, cutting out the face shell on the outside of the building before they put the veneer up tying into the dowels. Some places we had to actually go down into the foundations, formed them up, grounded them up, and got it taken care of. But again, we were above it and beyond what our contracts said we were supposed to do as far as inspections on this project as the designer. We just unfortunately had a, a mason who was a little bit devious on this project, but fortunately the, the, the steel director was helping us out. <coughs> International Home Furnishing Center, High Point, do a lot of work out here. This is one of the craziest complexes that you'll ever see. There's probably six million square oh. feet. Six million square feet worth of showroom space. In particular, in this building that you're looking at, this the canopy in front of it, there's about three million square feet of, of showroom space. Six different buildings all together, right? As we've been doing work on these buildings for the last 30 years, 35 years, we've run across some pretty interesting situations. It's hard to see, but this is a, a precast concrete panel that's right here, right above the sidewalk, this terminal that's there. Someone noticed from an adjacent building that the panel looked like it was bowing. It's at the eighth floor. It actually is bowed out three inches at the center right here took a look at it, see what was going on. Two of the four precast connections, the steel connections, not welded, not even close. There's an inch, inch and a half gap between the actual steel on the panel and the steel that ties back to the structure. Later on, at this low roof back in here, one of the panels actually came loose a week before market was started. It fell and landed up against another wall. It was in a little window nook, so it wasn't ultimately a problem, but it could have been a serious issue had it been one of these guys out here. So we did a little bit more investigation, and literally about 50% of the precast connections in that building were not welded. They were some tack welded, some not at all. Just did. And it was absolutely amazing and fortunate that something serious didn't happen. Came back, spent about a million and a half dollars doing nothing but adding precast connections to make sure that those panels are tied back to the building. So just recently, we're working on a different portion doing some brick repair. And uh, <coughs> cracking in it, putting flashing in, a bunch of other stuff. Contractor's out there. It's like, I need you to take a look at, at the parapet. So here's a picture of the parapet, steel beam, all right? The brick, the mass masonry and parapet is built up off the top of that beam. Not a problem, except that they never added plates to wrap around the column. So we have this corner section of brick that is not supported. It's just hanging off the edge of the building. This is the 11th floor. This is the parapet off the 11th floor. You can't see it, but there's a vertical crack in the masonry right here. And there's a vertical crack on the other side right before it gets to the plate. Just hanging out up there. They came in, they put some shoot uh, some shoring in, keep it, we're going to add some plates, we're going to get it straightened up. Again, when the, the exterior white brick was there, probably not an issue. However, now that it wasn't, you know, you see that there's a problem. So we're on the lift, we're coming down, and I notice this. This is a, a column at when they added the 11th floor. This building in particular was built in three different phases. First seven floors, then they added um, floors 8 through 11, but the 11th floor was done in two phases, half of it, and then the second half came back. This column was beveled on each side and at the web. They were going to come in full penetration welds, weld it up, except they didn't. It's like 40 years, this 11th 
this column at the 11th floor. You can see right there, it's displaced, not bearing on the steel column below. That framing at that 11th floor, that column, completely unwelded. It, it had maybe a, an inch tops of tack weld. It's up there, crazy. I don't think it was any way that they were trying to get away with it. I think it just happened. It just got covered up. Special inspections has, you know, some advantages to make sure that things like this don't happen and ultimately serious problems. Again, yeah, very fortunate that nothing ever happened with this and we got it welded up and taken <coughs> care of. It just could have been a really serious issue. So again, talking about that, some cases, you know, there was the devious mason, but a lot of it is speed, money, just the construction process. Starting, stopping, if you're doing renovations in places, a coliseum, for instance, that's operational, you're starting and stopping constantly. There's a chance for, for errors. And that's what the subcommittee found, and they're trying, you know, the report, the uh, special inspections process is a way to try and help eliminate those potential issues that, that occur. And again, you know, we can't forget our failures that ultimately <coughs> resulted in a lot of, of life lost and injury. You can't put price on any of that kind of stuff, obviously. So in addition, you know, we talked about there's insurance that the, the contract documents are being carried out properly as owners, as general public, depending on what the, the structures are. That's very important, uh, very important point. Increased presence of the structural engineer, you're getting the person who designed it, the most intimate knowledge with that structure on site more often, making sure that this structure is the way it's supposed to be. Decrease in long-term maintenance, the rain slab, you know, again, it was having, it had carpet over top of it, but there, without question, would be no ability <coughs> issue with that concrete. And then, like I said, shorter response time, construction issues, uh, discrepancies, concealed conditions, whatever it might be, having those people on site and that, that increased communication helps that process um, speed up. So, when are special inspections required? I'll turn that over to Tim and go through the process. So, my name is Tim Cook. I'm here in the Charlotte area. Um, I'm a project manager. And I'm going to try and give you like a 25,000 foot view of when special inspections are required. Um, I've, I've learned a lot preparing for this, I'll have to tell you. <laughs> it's, it's, this is a complicated, I, I, I think um, North Carolina might have butchered it a little bit trying to, trying to dodge around um, special inspections and it, it's, a, it's sort of a torturous path to figure out what gets where special inspections are required. So to understand, to get started understanding when they're required, we need to understand different occupancy types because that drives uh, what special inspections are needed. Um, so I'll briefly go through that. I'm not sure you're probably familiar with this. There's the uh, occupancy category four, which is essentially the most important structures in our society, I guess. Um, the, 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 the structures that you want to function during an emergency. If, we, if, if the zombie apocalypse happens, these are the buildings that you want to still be standing. Um, emergency rooms where you can do surgery. And there's the famous photograph of uh, the earthquake, I guess it was in um, San Francisco where a, a garage collapsed on top of an ambulance, an emergency uh, vehicle, and it couldn't get out to help people. So, in fact, emergency garages are part of a Category 4 building, one of the most important. Uh, next level down are buildings that are less important, but yet still important. Um, civil buildings, um, water sewer, things that would be a major inconvenience if they were shut down like power, water, sewer, and buildings that are have a high occupancy rate um, where they have a higher hazard to human um, life. And then the lowest level category, occupancy category one, is buildings that have really 
not much um, hazard in their failure, like a, a greenhouse or a chicken house, agricultural kind of a building where not much, if, if a chicken house collapses, not much uh, danger of human life lost. And then there's everything else. Um, mostly low-level commercial buildings, that sort of thing. But basically every other building besides what I've talked about goes into this other category, type two. And that's usually what we're working with. Now, the code, this is where it gets sort of complicated. When we go into the code, this is the, this is the root of where the code says you shall provide special inspection. 1704.1.2 and then from at that point there are two divisions of special inspections. There's the whole building type which is basically the structural systems inside a building. That makes a lot of sense. Then there's a second type down here in green that we call itemized systems. Those are systems that in <coughs> any building if they if you have any of these systems they need to they require special inspections the lowest level building you can think of this is just a breaking out I'm going to show you a flow chart in, in just a second but there are the whole buildings which is basically the structural systems and the itemized parts such as deep foundations retaining walls smoke systems um, spray fire protection and other special engineering systems. So here's the flow chart. And it, it's taken me two weeks to come up with this. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you can't read it, I'm, I know, but if, if, if you want a copy, I'd be glad to give it to you. Um, but again, this is, this is the 25,000 foot looking way from above at it. Each one of these boxes particularly this, the seismic box down here that I'll get into a little bit, will direct you to another code that shows you, okay, you got seismic problems, okay, here's your long list of things you got to look at uh, for your moment frame, still moment frame, for example. So we're in 1704.1.2. We have our first decision is, is it a, is it a, do we, categorize ourselves as a whole building? Are we, can we go back one slide? Inside the whole building, if you're a category two building, the run of, run of the mill building, you're less than 45 feet tall or less than three stories. You don't, you're not, your building does not require special inspections except for these itemized things. If you're a Category 3 or Category 4, or one of those important buildings, you always have to have special inspections for your structural systems. Okay? So, if you have a short building like, a, say, a Walmart Express, you probably don't qualify for, a, for special inspections. I do a lot of gas expresses. There are buildings that would fit inside this room. And all you do is it, it holds some beer and some candy bars and a guy to take your money when you pay for gas. That's, that's, that's what the function of the building is. So that building is low enough and it's not a category three or four, although it might be inconvenient if you can't get your beer, but it's not a category <laughs> three building. So it does not qualify for, you don't need to, to do special inspections on that. Unless, you have one of these conditions down here. If my gas express is held up on deep foundations, then those deep foundations require special inspection. <coughs> if I have a retaining wall around that gas express that's higher than five feet tall, then I, that wall has to be specially inspected. And smoke systems, spray fire systems, so on. Let's go to the next slide. Now that I've tried to clarify that, your first, your first decision is, is your building important? Okay, let's say it's not. Let's say it's a gas express. 
So you go down here to the next question. Does it have a special system like I described? Deep foundation, tall retaining wall. Is there any kind of smoke ventilation you need to worry about? Spray fire protection, any specials, all that. No. You go down here to the next one. And this is, we're going to have to go on the sidebar now. If the answer is yes, then you provide special inspections for those systems. If the answer is no, you have another decision. Is it in a high wind speed zone? The code is, to me, it's complicated how you arrive at this. But if your building is subject to high wind speeds, and I'm, gonna, I'm paraphrasing that, high wind speeds. In this case, it's type C, exposure class C, and a wind speed greater than 110. That's generally, I'm going to say, around Fayetteville and East, then you are required to provide special inspections um, for wind for wind design. Now I have a question. Um, anybody know what the where the highest um, wind speed recorded is in this state? Outer bank. Where? The outer bank. Outer banks. That's. Grandfather Mountain. Grandfather Mountain is his correct answer. A lot of people don't know that. All right. Good <laughs> um, In fact, when I, I worked in Asheville for a while, and we did some work up there. Um, it's very windy there, by the way. Um, the, the, we were told that the highest wind speed they had ever recorded was 195. A wind gust of 195, and that and that's when the anemometer got blown off the top of the building. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I say that because be careful about your wind speeds because when you get in the if you look in the code closely, there are shaded shaded um, counties in the in the west, and those are special wind regions. And I wish it was in the code now, but some of my codes from like several years ago, there there is actually an image in there that shows a mountaintop. And the closer you get to a named, to the crest of a named mountaintop, the wind speed gets up to 130 miles an hour. And then as you back down every 500 feet, it, 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 you lose 10 miles an hour. So the biggest wind speeds aren't down in Wilmington. I mean, where I'm from, we have that plan. So, just be careful where your wind speeds are, or, or what they are. Don't assume if you're on the coast or you're not on the coast that you're safe. So anyway, back to this. The code specifies if, if you have a, you always have to check to see if you're in the, the wind zone. Even if you have a non-important gas express building. Okay. All right, let's go back to the top. And I'm going to... We're going to skip through this kind of fast. So yes, so you're, you're, you have to perform all these special inspections that I'll get into it in a second. But what I want to show you is the size of so it goes up. Well, the wind. Here's what you need to do for the wind. Essentially, the wind inspections are telling you to check for everything that might blow off the building. Cladding, uh, leading roof edges. Um, your shear wall diaphragms, all those things are, this is actually outlined in this section, 705.4, tells you what you need to state or what the engineer needs to state in his statement of special inspections that need to get inspected. But it's a good outline of what would need to be. Um, it tells us what, what um, we need to inspect for. Seismic is similar, except that seismic, my gas express, according to our code, is not subject to special inspections for seismic. Only if you have the whole building, if you meet the requirements for an important building, a big important building, are you required to do the seismic resistance. Wind is different. We, apparently the state looks at wind different than seismic. So back to this. So now we're gonna we're gonna walk through um, this. So if we have if 
we have a whole building, we have a relatively important building. It's it's a type two that's greater than 45 feet tall, or it's a type three or four occupancy, then we're constrained to this stuff. So, so now how do we implement the special inspections? And this is where the nuts and bolts occur. So when you go into the whole building part, you're looking at all the different materials. Go, go back to. This will give you a list. This list right here is basically all the structural materials and systems that you have to inspect for in in your whole relatively important building. <coughs> There's steel, concrete, precast, masonry, wood, um, soils, and heaps. Now the very first statement, and I should add a slide right before this one, but the very first thing you have to do is inspect the fabricators. Fabricators of precast, uh, steel fabricators, wood fabricators, anything that would be prefabricated in a plant setting and then shipped to the site. All those things that happen in that plant have to be inspected. There's a way around that. And if you if you happen to go on AISC.org, there's some great articles in there about the importance of plant certification and fabricator pre-certification. Um, AISC has a certification program. And what the code, when it talks about the fabricator shall be it says a special inspector shall go to the, to the fabrication site and inspect everything that goes on unless they're certified. And the certification shows that the fabricator <coughs> knows how to, for example, track mill material like this mill, <coughs> this W8 by 18 that came from this mill that has this kind of steel in it actually is made it to that building over there. They have a great quality control system. It's it's uh, audited periodically and a, an organization like AISC or for example in precast industry PCI has certified this plant and they're good to go. You can trust what they do. If you have that situation then under certain circumstances you don't need to have special inspections of what goes on in the plant building official can, can approve those. So that's, if, if you don't, I guess, if you don't take away anything else, when you specify steel or precast, make sure it comes from a, a certified plant. So, that being said, we'll look at, this is for example, after it comes out into the field, um, these are just, in a nutshell, the things that we have to be looked for. Primarily connections, um, bolts. If they're in a snug tight condition, then you can just periodically check them. However, if they're in a um, pretension kind of bolt or a slip critical kind of connection, they have to be continuously inspected. So, as a structural engineer, when I'm doing my designs, I try to design around idiot-proof things as much as I can. So I try to specify, any, never specify anything beyond a snow tote, snow tight bolt because snow tight means if it's snow tight, it's good. I can anybody can look at it and see that it's good. It doesn't require any testing. It doesn't require continuous monitoring. So as an engineer, I try to specify things that don't require so much. Wells are another example. Single pass fillet wells, 5 sixteenths and less, don't require continuous special inspections. Um, anything bigger than that requires continue, uh, someone has to be watching them make that weld and not only that, they have to test it because it's, it's a two pass weld. So you don't know what's going on underneath, that's why it has to be a con continuously monitored. 
Now, it is still necessary though to visually put your eyes on every weld. But even if they're 3 16 fillet, they need to be visually assessed. The code tells us that. Um, in, inside. But you're allowed to only do a visual assuming that the welders are qualified and, and their quality control procedures are in place. So. Next is concrete. Most everything, a lot of the concrete, oddly is, oddly to me, is not, not continuous. We, the code says that you periodically inspect the rebar. Um, what's continuous are things like welded reinforcement or mechanical splices. Now, I think the code, I think the code is purposely um, vague on what is meant by periodic. And I think that, this is Tim Cook talking, I think that um, It is incumbent on the engineer of record to write a thorough statement of special inspections. Um, if I, I've, I've been a special inspector on one job, not two jobs. The one job that I that I was the special ins the one of them I was the engine also the engineer of record. So I kind of knew, even though my statement of special inspections wasn't perfect, I knew what I was looking for. I knew what was important. But if I were a, if I were a special inspector and I was looking at a job from another EOR and I had to go by the statement of special inspections that sometimes I see, I'd be pulling my hair out because I wouldn't know. It's it's hard. There's not a clear line of well, what do you want me to look at? How hard do you want me to look? When you say periodic, what does periodic mean? Once every 10 days, that's a period. Once every hour, that's another period. But what do you want? So I think as structural engineers, we need to really think about how we put together a statement of special inspections. And further, I think it would help um, when the owner goes out looking to procure um, those SI contracts to have a clear definition of exactly what does periodic mean exactly? Okay. I'll get off my. Yeah, seismic, seismic resistance is a tough one sometimes. Yeah, well, I'm, we're, it, it is. And even as I read through this, it's hard to define. <coughs> well, okay, anything can shake. What do you want me to look at? So anyway, precast. Precast concrete is kind of dumped into cast in place concrete, but you had your precast uh, wells that didn't make it to the job. <laughs> so that, that's one of the that's one of the things that probably the most critical item you would look at as far as precast. But think about think about how much is built in the plant. You know, all those strands that get tension to some specific number. If you don't if you don't have a certified plant doing that work, then you need a special inspector there um, who's actually qualified and understands what a tendon is. Look at looking at that. So that's why I go back to make sure that your precast supplier is certified. And that takes a lot of those worries away. Masonry. Aaron showed you an example of a boxed up masonry job. A lot of this is periodic. You know, it, 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 is, it says in the code periodic inspections during construction, reinforcement. Well, that's a minimum. You know, the engineer record might say, you know, I want every stick of rebar in the wall looked at. It's that important to me. Now, this, this, there are two levels of inspection depending on the occupants. We go back and say this is a masonry going into a fire station. 
then this all these things step up a level. And this actually might turn into continuous. You look at every stick of rebar. Wood construction. Wood is kind of limited. And I think part of that is because a lot of the wood construction is redundant. It's, it's spelled out in the code what it is. And what's critical in the wood is the high load diaphragms. I don't know if any of you have actually ever looked at how somebody nails a piece of plywood up and counts on it being a die. If you overdrive the nails a quarter of an inch, you lose like 50% of the strength. It, it happens. And then it also asks you to check long span trusses. Um, particularly how those trusses are braced. How many of you have ever heard of uh, failure in the roof because the trusses collapsed during construction. I think I think this is particularly this section right here is driven around that. You have to have a special inspector look at the temporary construction braces bracing and sign off on it before anything moves ahead. Um it goes for masonry as well. Yeah. The temporary bracelet. Yes, yeah, that's true. That's something that's often overlooked because I don't see many, how many times you've driven down the road you see a Walmart with a 40 foot tall wall and nothing but scaffolding on both sides. I've seen it done a lot of times for the uh, like the three and four story masonry uh, stairwells and yeah. elevator shafts. That's and right. They, <laughs> they run the masons in, they, they put up the three floors. They and, and they leave. And they leave. And then and the rest of the structure is still at ground level. <laughs> Why do I have a crack in my wall? You see that all the time. Now we're, gonna, we're looking at those itemized parts. Um, anything, deep driven piles, cast in place, uh, deep foundations, that's a case on. Um, helical pile foundations. Um, again, the, the itemized things that would go in any building. Uh, whether it meets that whole building category or not, if your building, like my gas express, has these elements, it needs to be special, have special inspection. Um, fire coatings, eaves systems, um, and the eaves is excluded if there is a, a barrier coating behind it. Now there's like grain belief systems. If you have those, those don't require, at least my interpretation is, you don't, those don't require special inspections. And then um, special cases. There are conditions where we engineer things that aren't necessarily in the code. Um, carbon fiber reinforcement, for example. That's probably something that should, should be specially inspected, maybe overlooked. Um, any, any kind of system that's specialized, for example, um, epoxy embedded anchors, how critical are those things? How critical is it? Are those um, how clean they get the holes? You don't see that list in in, in not this big long list we've talked about. You don't see epoxy at easy bangers, but probably those should be specially inspected. That's why it's talking about these special cases that aren't specifically covered by the code. But again, as an EOR, as an engineer of record, I feel like it's your responsibility to point those things out. If something's critical, we need to put it in our statement of special inspections. And then lastly, special inspections for smoke control, um, proper ventilation, and this is actually pretty specific what they require here. I wish, I wish the rest of it was this specific. But, um, but any, any time you have ventilation or smoke control, that's also covered in chapter uh, uh, 910 um, in the mechanical part of the code. So money. Obviously, construction costs money and having special inspections costs money. It's not just given out for free. It's not how it happens. North Carolina <coughs> State Construction Office doesn't have a ton of data on it, but <coughs> over the last five to eight years, they've been gathering some information about what the actual costs are for special inspections. 
and they estimate that it runs between a quarter and one percent of the construction cost. Um, obviously, it depends on the type of structure, the occupancy load, the materials, whether it's got heavy continuous inspections, even a steel building. As Tim was saying, if you design those steel buildings around the slip, the, the um, a slip critical connection or heavy welded full penetration joint weld or just um, standard bolted connection, it has major, major impact to the actual cost of uh, the special inspection review process. One of the things that the State Construction Office recommends, and it's you know, for owners, for designers to discuss with owners, is budgeting for the special inspections project. 1%, kind of a good rule of thumb as far as the budgeting goes. But really, every project should be looked at specifically once that statement of special inspections has been developed. Because again, there are ways that you can try and alleviate some of that cost. Who ultimately ends up being the special inspector changes that cost. So every time, it needs to be something that's ultimately looked at to develop an, an actual cost for that project. Now, there is some savings that, that comes into the process. Used to the code used to allow uh, a reduction in masonry. So when you were a designer, if you were designing your masonry structures for non-special inspections or for special inspections, there was a factor of two as far as the actual allowable stresses that you were allowed to use. You could reduce reinforcing, you could reduce grouting, you could reduce a lot of the actual construction costs that went along with it if you had special inspections. That has come out, again, part of it is because it's now a mandatory process, uh, a part of the code, but there is some inherent savings in situations like masonry. Project that our building solutions group in Greensboro worked on, they did a major repair project installing a bunch of retrofit anchors because the brick ties were omitted on this project. Again, money that you don't see any improvement for. It's really just tying the actual brick facade back to the structure. They were starting to get cracks, distress, came in and looked, we did an investigation, no brick ties. Again, how does that happen? I mean, it, it's not that old of a building. So the owner on subsequent projects has actually added, in addition to the minimum special inspections requirements, they have added into scope where you are reviewing brick ties on a periodic basis, scanning walls, making sure that all those ties get added in, because that project ended up costing them, I want to say it was three quarters of a million dollars just to add brick ties back in to tie the facade back. To them, there's value in having, spending $5,000, maybe $10,000 to the special inspector periodically review that process, specifically looking for brick ties 16 inches on center, wherever it goes, so that they don't run into that problem down the road. So there are ways to get precast, the precast connections that we talked about. That million and a half dollars that is all behind the wall, all just steel connections. $10,000, $20,000 during that construction process saves a million and a half dollars down the road. There are advantages, there are some cost savings that owners may not realize down the road. So who is the special inspector? Okay, there's, it's an expertise. You, you know, we talked about it early on, but even the definition of code, it's inspections that are performed by an expert in that field, looking at it and the different materials. Whenever there is a permit, whenever someone applies for a permit for construction, you have to go in and identify the construction, the special inspection process, and then ultimately who is going to be the special inspector of record for the project. And there's a couple of different entities that can serve as the special inspector, but they have to demonstrate competence in their field. Structural engineer of record, architect of record, third party engineers, all of these people and then their, their subsequent um, agents working underneath of them, serving in those special inspector roles. And there's recommendations and the code defines in much greater detail who can perform what duties. And we're not going to get into all of that. We'll talk about it briefly. But it's a registered design professional, architect or engineer, that is a responsible charge reviewing the work. You can have EIs. You can have technicians who have gone through certification processes. 
um, ultimately you have to have a PE or AIA that is overseeing the process. Uh, first one we're going to take a look at, a couple different ways to, to set up the actual uh, SCR, the SI role. We'll look at the first one, the structural engineer, the structural engineer of records serving as a special inspector. They do everything in this role. Uh, doesn't happen a lot, not a ton of uh, structural firms around that have full scope services, including geotechnical. You get into some of those deep foundation systems. Um, there's, you can get into quite a few different levels of, of um, both review for different materials, but then also the testing. Their material testing comes into it as well. And there's not a lot of uh, structural firms that have a whole line of services. However, if you do have that, that is a huge advantage. It's a great opportunity. Um, the structural engineer of record knows the design the best. They have the most intimate knowledge of what that system, all those systems are doing, how stressed they are, what is the important components of it as they're looking through. They can really tailor their review to that system. It also allows that designer of record to be on site a lot more. You know, it helps with communication back and forth with discrepancies, uh, they have that, which helps the contractor. The contractor actually likes that in a lot of cases because if there's an issue that, that arises, you have that individual on site, they can review it, they can respond immediately to that the, the process. If it needs input from the, the architect or mechanical, there's a relationship that's there built through the design process, understand, you know, working back and forth, all that coordination. It helps alleviate some of that, that downtime, um, that lag, during any type of um, discrepancy that comes up. Second one is structural engineer with uh, subcontractors. This is one that we get into in a lot. I actually, uh, I like this role, with, um, this setup. Um, it, it brings the geotech, if you can get the geotech and CMT firm that did the, the drilling and the, did the soils on the site, get them in as a subcontractor with the structural engineer of record. You get the designer of record, multiple designers of record on the project at the same time. And you get that materials firm. So again, that design team continuity is kept throughout the construction process. You get the expert in the soils field looking at the soils. You get the experts in the construction materials testing looking at it. And this is a, a really good option if you don't have a, the structural engineer of record having the full in-house services. A lot of the same advantages that you have. Third party structural engineer serves as the SI again with complete scope of services. Same limitations as the SER, you need to have all of those, the third, uh, all of the services in-house. This has also got some advantages to it. You get a third party uh, competent engineering firm, structural engineer that gives a review of the job. They're looking at the plans to get up to speed. They're looking at all the submittals. You're getting kind of a, a built-in peer review process, hiring a third-party structural engineer to serve as the special inspector. They're familiar with the, the different systems, familiar with construction process, so it takes them a little bit of time to get up to speed, but once they do, it's another set of eyes on the job, looking at it, helping resolve some of those problems, communicating issues. So this, is, this also has some advantages over um, if the structural engineer of record is not willing or capable to do it, getting a third party structural engineer to, to review the process got some advantages to it as well. Third party SE with subcontractors, kind of a mesh of the, the previous ones we've talked about, advantages, disadvantages. And then the final one is having a third party non-structural engineer, um, CMT, that provides it. Don't have the structural engineer typically on staff for the, the materials testing agencies or geotech. Typically that the, the uh, engineer serves as the SI is either geotech or a lot of times they're the materials engineer. And there's there's advantages to that. You don't they don't necessarily have the, the intimate knowledge of the structural systems, the um, all of the different components and how they're working together with the actual structure, but they do have knowledge of the actual materials that are going in, and maybe in a lot of cases more so than even the structural engineer would. Um, 
They're all staffed. They have the materials testing right there, so it's one source that's providing the SI to everybody. Looking at how you actually procure it, you can do it a couple different ways. You can set it up where it's a direct contract with multiple different agents from the owner to the actual special inspector, either as the SER and being primed with subs or just multiple contracts to the different entities. Some cases, and it's happening a little bit um, more, is where you do it as part of the designer of record contract. Run into situations where the architect of record, who's typically a prime designer, doesn't want to take on that responsibility as well. It adds another level to their responsible, to what they're ultimately overseeing. They don't necessarily want to do that. Um, but it is one point of contact, one contract, you can do it as an extension. As an owner, there's advantages to that. Um, it used to be where you could put it in as a, a line item, an allowance into the construction so that the contractor actually pays it out. Some cases, some building officials still allow that to happen. Again, trust you know, the, 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 the companies providing the special, uh, special inspection services, contractor, you feel comfortable with their relationship, building officials will allow that. Some cases, they've shut that down. It's a they, you know, the potential conflict of interest there. You have the contractor withholding money from the special inspector, whoever it might be, the owner. It can be a fight, no question about it. So you see that as well. Um, and that's I, believe, I believe it's in the code that it's not exempted anymore. It is. And there's certain, there's certain buildings, only, only certain on states. Design, only on design build projects in, right. North, in North Carolina. That's right. I think the state, I think Kentucky has actually banned it completely, looking through some of their stuff. So some states are going away from it totally, not allowed at all. Some places different. Uh, delivery methods or in, in different jurisdictions actually they have different approaches to it. So again, the, uh, looking at some of the qualifications, we talked about it briefly, got to be a PE to be or AIA to be the special inspector and then from there you have the people actually out in the field looking at it. Engineers that having an EI certification, a PE certification or you can go ACI PCI, AISC, AWS, all of those different, the, the steel, the masonry, concrete, the different um, organizations that are in each of those fields have certification processes that you can send individuals to, technicians um, within the company, certified to look at specific items. So go and get your uh, ACI certification and there's different levels of it. If you don't have the PE, you don't have that uh, AIA or EI qualification, you can still go and become certified to look at concrete, to look at welds, to look at precast connections. So there's a lot of different levels as long as each one of those individuals ultimately re um, reports back to the PE or AIA that's in charge. That wraps up our presentation. Uh, special inspections, I've covered a lot. Chapter 17 is like you know, as you can see, there's a lot to it, and constantly evolving and changing. And uh, we ran through it pretty quick. So if there's any questions, happy to try and answer them. I had a question. Mm -hmm. uh, regardless of which methods you use to to have the special inspections done, the engineer record is the one who writes the statement of special inspections. That's correct. It can be most times it's the structural engineer of record that does it. Sometimes the architect of record will do it. Um, the best approach really is what, whoever leads up that the actual writing of it is engaging all the different entities because if there's soils that are, you know, it kind of goes back to what Tim was saying, making sure that it's specific. When there's soils, deep foundations involved, you want to get input from your geotech. That's there. Uh, there are precast architectural components or the fireproofing. Typically that structural engineer doesn't write the spec for fireproofing. It's messy. You want to get input from your architect or any of your other consultants that would be involved. You get into some of the um, heavier seismic issues, bracing of your uh, mechanical ductwork, some of the different ducts or storage racks or generators becomes much more important at that point in time. So it's got to be a group effort, again, ultimately getting there. But you designate typically either the structural engineer does it, sometimes the architect write that statement. Just out of curiosity, what was the retrofit fix for the missing brick ties? Uh, we, we came in and we added uh, 
the actual retrofit ties into that one. It was a masonry backup system, I believe. And so we had the, each one of the brick ties that we ended up using in there is about $25 a piece. So you because drill, do you drill, you drill through, through the, the mortar joint and into the, the uh, CMU backup mm -hmm. and put in your brick tie that goes in and expands out and engages the CMU behind it. And then again, you have another twist that engages the, the mortar joints on the outside of it, cover it over. And it's, you know, when you're adding those at 16 inches on center, two feet on center, it adds up in a hurry, unfortunately. What's your personal preference on who the special inspector is? And, and Tim, you can answer as well. Is it, yeah. Do you think it's better to always have the SER or a third party? Or what, what's your opinion? I, being structural engineer, I like having, <laughs> I, I really think having the structural engineer of record uh, be the special inspector is is the best situation. And, you know, unfortunately, we've gone after some special inspections projects as a third party special inspector and lost out. But when we've lost out to the, the structural engineer of record, I'm okay with that. Those people have the most intimate knowledge of the, the systems and, again, are going to be out there. People who actually did the design are looking at the reinforcing steel, looking at the connections. Know that when we were trying to noodle through how we're going to figure out this circular truss connections, that there's things that we need to be focusing on. Um, having those individuals, but like I said, I like having the, the, the SER and uh, uh, Geotech CMT firm as a combination. I feel like it provides uh, a good combination of individuals to the owners who do it. Special inspect the, the SER is out there looking at different components when you get into deep foundation soils. You have your geotech who's a resource to come out, do that review. I'm not gonna go out and look at the soils. It's not my expertise, but I want that geotech who drilled it, who wrote that report, gave the rec recommendations to be doing that. Same thing with the deep foundations. They also have the testing ability a lot that we that we don't, don't normally have. But again, you're working through that design process, working throughout the whole, you know, from start to finish. You've built up that rapport. The communication is easy at that point in time. Also, there's, you know, having the two different companies, there's some potential if there's conflicts in schedules. You have two different companies that can cover, you know, get an arrangement that's worked out. Because most of those CMT, they have, um, ACI, they have AWS certified technicians who can go out and look at it in addition to performing the testing. So there's there's uh, redundancy built into the actual review for personnel. I think it works really well. And um, I know that on the projects that we that I've served as special inspector, it's been that role and it has worked it's worked very well to, to give the owner, you know, a good good review. So, so when these projects are underway, does the SI participate in like the monthly meetings and that Absolutely. kind of thing? So they're part of that team, right? Absolutely. Yeah, regardless of whether the, the engineer of record or the third party, they're in there, they're giving their report, you know, because again, it's, we're, it's one of the things we really didn't get into a whole lot because we could spend an hour and a half talking about just reporting. I mean, really special inspections is, it's documentation. It's review, but it's documenting the process. And it's thousands and thousands of pages of documentation. And some of those projects that we showed um, the rain slab, I want to say that our ultimately our special inspections report on that was close to 3,000 pages of just daily reports, weekly reports, monthly reports, then all of the, the certificates for the materials, everything grouped together. It was a 12, 14 month project, so we had 14 you know, monthly reports that went into then the final report that kind of combines all of that stuff. So it's a tremendous amount of actual documentation, but yes, you know, when there's a discrepancy noted, and it's noted on that, that day, immediately the contractor is notified of it. They're given the actual, what the issue is. They're signing to make sure that they're aware of it. That information then is, is sent out to all the different parties who are involved. Owner, subcontractor, if it's the case, structural engineer of record, architect, so that everybody knows that a discrepancy was issued. And then you track that and you keep that log open until it's ultimately resolved. Sometimes it's the next day. In the case of that, the rain slab, that thing was open for months because we were waiting on the, we took the cores, 
We sent it off for petrographic analysis. That takes time. We had to come up with the actual resolution, and we talked back and forth. We, we went through some iterations with the contractor. So that that open item stayed there for three months, four months, whatever it might have been. Ultimately, got resolved. Though, right? That's right. Construction continued. We were working on a plan. It held up finishes, that type of thing that was in there. But ultimately, it didn't get covered up until that discrepancy was resolved. And that's kind of really the point of special inspections. You're reviewing it, you see that there's a problem, you make sure that it's tracked and everybody knows about it until there's actual resolution to it so that it doesn't get covered up and down the road it becomes a much more serious problem. One last question. So you got special inspections on a project, the project is over with, down the road if some issue arises that, that sort of uh, causes litigation to occur. Um, is, is the special inspector in that chain of accountability, in that chain of liability? Going Absolutely. Through? Okay. Yep. There's no question about it. And again, you know, it's one of the things, it, as the, the structural engineer of record serving as the SI, there is extra accountability at that point in time. You are looking at your design, you're reviewing it. Again, you have the person who did the design who knows it the best doing it, so you you're, should be getting the most comprehensive, in-depth review. That person then is your, really your ultimate responsibility holder as far as the construction design and the review. Now there's other people that obviously the contractor is still responsible. They have to, they, you know, they're responsible for the work they're putting in place. But yes, that special inspector without a doubt has responsibility in that process. One problem that I, I'm a litigator, that I, I seem to see um, a fair amount is that you've got the contractor who's responsible for scheduling special inspections. Correct. Um, that can cause problems and has caused problems. And I yes. wonder if you have any thoughts um, on how to address that in contracting up front, if there is, is a way to do that. Or is that <coughs> something... You know, you spoke about the uh, Tim spoke about the importance of you know really writing a tight statement of special inspections. Are there other ways that, that you see to address that problem? There is. I mean, I, they, you know, <laughs> that relationship, that interaction has been a problem for a long time before special inspections, yeah. whatever it might <laughs> <Yeah>. be. <laughs> it's but, why I have a job, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> writing really defining. Your statement of special inspections help and you can jump in whenever you want if you can clearly define what periodic means all right now it's a fluid process there's no question about it there is not one set in stone hard answer because again you go out and maybe your even your periodic inspections they adjust you start looking at your steel connections or um, the, the reinforcing installation for masonry concrete and you're looking at it on a much more frequent basis early on in the process. Okay? The structural engineer, the, the special inspector of record, they get a comfort level that the contractor has, he knows what he's doing, he's very conscientious, he's working through the problems, he's trying to head issues off before they get there, and it's a good working relationship. Again, maybe you start to, to relax some of that, you know, how stringent that period, that period is. So it's three days instead of two days, whatever it might be. You're still looking at everything, but it's not quite as frequent. Um, it really is, again, it comes down to communication. You have to make sure that everybody is on board. And I think that part of the weekly, monthly meetings that have as part of the construction have to address that. You know, obviously schedule is something that is talked about a lot. And it's talked about for a lot of different reasons, money, you know, completing the project on time, when subs are going to be there, but designer review, special inspector review, with the exception of literally having somebody on site full time, all the time, that can look at everything or anything. Again, that's not necessarily feasible in every situation. Sometimes it is. Um, but it has to be, you have to review the construction process and the special inspector um, frequency on a, on a weekly and monthly basis. I mean, it, it just changes. Because again, you can get out there. On the one project that we looked at, it was there were seven buildings. So we were work, they were working on seven buildings simultaneously. Masonry, concrete, steel, welding. I mean, the, the scheduling of that is crazy. You know, we had people running around back and forth all over the place, again, trying to keep up with it and then documentation with it. But you start with a solid baseline 
in your your statement of special inspections that outlines and it gives it gives time frames as a starting point. Then everybody can agree on and it, I mean you include it into the notes again. It's documentation and it's it's communication at that point in time. But if things are moving along smoothly or if they're not, you, you bump up the frequency of it. If you're having problems with a certain subcontractor, you know what? We're we're coming out every day. We're looking at this until we get a comfort level that these issues have been corrected because we've seen them, you know, for the last three weeks. It's not acceptable. Discrepancies are being held. They're not being resolved in time. That's another thing. Coming out to check. They're trying to cover up construction. So, again, it, it's a fluid process and it's going to change. But I, I think if you establish that, and even if it gets put into the agenda items, designer review, special inspector review, break it down, and then everybody, it's in the minutes, it's in the notes, everybody's agreeable to it, understands what's going on. Definitely can help. And Aaron's speaking to that, but you can also build it into the construction schedule. You have the general contractor, whoever's doing your scheduling on your project, actually identify it as an item on the schedule so that they're aware of the fact that, hey, we've got to have this poor looked at, we've got to yeah. have it included in the schedule. Part of it too helps is again when you you get their signatures. I mean, you provide the documentation. We've done this review. You make sure that the contractor, the general contractor who's in charge, what who, the superintendent, whoever it is, they get that report and there is a signed copy of it. You know that they're aware that they've gone through that process. I mean, again, it helps helps somewhat with that that situation. <laughs> Typically, you'll have like pre-construction. That's right. every area like concrete, mm -hmm. masonry, where you have all the parties involved for that particular set of construction. And you talk about those things at that time, you know, Absolutely. frequency of inspection. You say, I want to be notified for every time you place concrete. I may not look at it every time, but at least let me know. So I have the option to go look at it. But communication, I mean, that's, that's you. Yep. Anybody else? Great. Thank you.